Well, good morning once again, and welcome to the second session of uh, this morning's meeting. So, 100th anniversary of the um, Terry Lectureship and this series on the uh, discussions that have taken place between faith and science over the 100 years of the, of the uh, fellowship, the Terry Fellowship. Uh, I'm Leo Hickey. I'm a member of the Department of Geology and Geophysics. I'm a paleontologist and also a member of the Terry Committee. And uh, we really are very glad uh, to see the turnout for this. Uh, this is very much as the donor would have wished, we imagine. On this, the approximate 100th anniversary, the money was actually received for this, fe uh, for this fellowship in 1905. But knowing how the provost's office works today and probably in the past, it probably took a year for this money to reach the people who really could use it. So we felt that 2006 would be an appropriate 100th anniversary for the fellowship. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kenneth R. Miller, and I emphasize the R, a distinguished biologist who has a, a dual career. He is, as a distinguished biologist, explored the biological membrane. He's been an early pioneer in the application and development of electron microscopy for biology and also looking at photosynthetic energetics. He's also been an advocate for the popular understanding of evolutionary biology, and I'm using evolutionary biology rather than Darwinism. He received his undergraduate Bachelor of Science degree from Brown University, where he is currently a professor, and his PhD from the University of, Cal uh, of Colorado. He has had teaching appointments at Harvard University and Brown, where he has been a professor since 1986. Dr. Um, Miller is the, the author of over 50 scientific papers in biology. He has been the editor of the first three volumes of the very influential series, Advances in Cell Biology. Uh, he's the co-author of uh, one of the major textbooks in high school biology, Oh, yes, Ken, but was it approved by the Texas Board of uh, Education? Yes, sir. That, that, that does it. And also the, a, a very important college textbook in biology as well, introductory textbook. Numerous essays and court appearances um, advocating evolution. And also the popular book, the very popular book, Finding Darwin's God, published in 1999 and currently working on a, a, another book exploring this topic, Devil in the Details, which is to appear in 2007, hopefully. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Miller, whose topic will be Darwin, God, and Dover, what the collapse of intelligent design means for science and faith in America. Dr. Miller. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a genuine pleasure to be here. I want to thank the Terry Lectureship and Yale um, and the committee for inviting me. Um, one never knows how one is going to be introduced. It was a very generous introduction by Leo, and I do indeed appreciate it. Um, as he mentioned, I am a cell biologist. I work on the structure and function of biological membranes. Um, I notice that there are a, a fair number of young people, students in the audience. I say young relative to me. Um, and uh, some of you may not know it, but you may already know me. Um, and if you think back, you may not like me. And one of the reasons for that is if you used any of these textbooks when you were in high school, I wrote them, um, along with a guy named Joel Levine. So many people coming out of high school biology uh, owe their bad backs. These books are all over 1,000 pages and other sorts of things to so the work that I've done. And Leo was kind enough to mention um, a book I wrote a couple of years ago on evolution and religion called Finding Darwin's God, uh, which I thought actually would be a nice little book. You know, Mom and Dad would get a copy. Uh, maybe my brother would put it on his bookshelf. It would go up in my CV, and that would be it. Uh, to my amazement and astonishment, this book is now in its 24th printing in paperback. Um, and it's the sort of thing that continues to generate either pleasure or outrage, depending upon your point of view on these things. The theme for the Terry Lectureship, of course, is the religion and science debate. Why does it continue? And, and I want to try to address that question 
I think the previous speaker also did a good job of addressing that question as well. But being a biologist, I tend to look at things in terms of empirical data rather than philosophical categories. So if you want to say, let's analyze why the debate continues, I want to find a controlled experiment in one sense or another that will tell me something about that. And I think the closest that I've been able to come to a controlled experiment is the state of Kansas. And many of you may know, um, and I say this having spoken at KU exactly a week ago, uh, in the summer of 1999, the elected Board of Education of Kansas voted literally to take all mention of evolution out of the state science curriculum. And reaction in the state was, was extraordinary. Uh, people immediately realized this is a very strange move. In one respect or another, it made Kansas, in some respects, the laughing stock of the rest of the country. I mean, you know you're in trouble when Jay Leno is making jokes about your state night after night after night. And people in Kansas, I discovered when I went there several years ago, are really tired of Wizard of Oz jokes relating to this. So I tried not to mention any of those. But the interesting thing about Kansas is that in recent years, it has replayed its role prior to the Civil War as a burned over district in which warring factions fought back and forth across the state. And if you followed events closely, you've seen this happen. So for example, in the summer of 2000, a majority of the Board of Education had to stand for re-election. I actually spent a week in Kansas that summer campaigning on behalf of Kansas Citizens for Science. I rented a pickup truck. I drove all around the state. I talked in church basements, town meetings, stuff like that. And lo and behold, I wasn't the only scientist who did this. Quite a few did. Um, and lo and behold, uh, scientists, science was the winner. In the election of 2000, the creationist majority was thrown out, and a new pro-science majority was seated that restored evolution to the science standards in Kansas. And this is the headline article that we can review in the New York Times talking about this, kind enough to mention my work and my book and all this other sort of good stuff. But as I say, these currents have ebbed and flowed. There was another election in 2004, and lo and behold, in that election, an anti-science, or at least anti-evolution majority was elected to the board, and they held a series of public hearings that were designed to show that there were serious problems with what they called evolution, and they wrote a set of science standards in the last year that completely redefined science, in their own words, to make non-naturalistic explanations part of science. And I don't have any idea what a non-naturalistic explanation is, unless it turns out to be a supernatural one. Um, and supernatural ex explanations as part of science are something I think that bothers many natural scientists. Well, as I say, this really has been a controlled case study. Because just last month, there was another set of elections for the Kansas Board of Education. And lo and behold, in the primary elections, this time pro-science candidates won. And there clearly will be at least a six to four pro-science majority, and possibly greater, actually, after the November elections. So when you look at Kansas, you see this ebb and flow of forces one way or another. And for people in the Northeast, where most of us are from, or at least most of us now live and work, um, don't look at Midwestern states and other places like Kansas as examples of American ignorance. Look at them as Amer examples of American popular democracy in action because the importance of science in the last election campaign just last month cannot be understated, nor can the number of ordinary people, scientists, educators, um, and professionals who spoke up for scientific integrity and carried the day in the Kansas elections. All of this ought to tell you that we live in interesting times. How interesting? Well, some of you may know that a few years ago, a board of education in Georgia decided that their new biology textbooks were so dangerous that they required a warning label to tell students evolution's just a theory, not a fact. And being good public-spirited citizens, you might want to know, gee, I wonder what book it was that was so dangerous that it required a warning label put on it. <laughs> and lo and behold, that's the book. I say that with some pride. Um, and this is the warning label. And you can see what it said. It said, this textbook has material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things this material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. And when that sticker went on, I was called up by a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And she prefaced her conversation by saying, Dr. Miller, aren't you outraged at this sticker that they put on your textbooks? And I thought about that for a minute, because I had talked to reporters before. 
And I, I decided, I thought what the reporter was doing was trolling for a quote. She wanted to write an article with an inflammatory headline like author outraged or author incensed and sl or better yet, northern author criticizes Board of Education. <laughs> Something like that would work. So I decided I didn't want to give her the satisfaction. And I said, well, um, I like the sticker. She said, you do? I said, yeah, I think the sticker is great. The only problem I have with the sticker is it doesn't go far enough. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the book has material on evolution, no argument there. Evolution is a theory. There's a chapter in this book called The Theory of Evolution. So of course evolution is a theory. No argument with that. But when you say theory, not a fact, that's very strange. Because it, it tells students that theories and facts are opposite things. And in fact, that's not the case at all. Um, facts, for example, um, the facts in science include the results of experiments and observations. Um, and they are put together. They are explained by explanatory theories. And the way I put it was, suppose a young person went to the University of Georgia and decided to study physics. They'd have to take courses in atomic theory. Think about that, a course in atomic theory. Are we going to change the names of those courses to atomic fact sometime in the future? Well, the answer is, of course not. Because what atomic theory does is it unites in an explanatory framework hundreds of thousands of observational experimental facts. That's what theories do. So to say that a theory is not a fact misstates it. Facts, theories never become facts. Theories explain facts. And that's what evolution does, too. But I told the, the, the sentence, when you get right down, it really bugs me as the last one. And she said, uh, uh, you're against open-mindedness or careful study or critical. And I said, no, you don't understand. I don't object to that as an evolutionist. I object to that as a cell biologist. Because you know how a 14-year-old will read that? That will tell the 14-year-old, we are certain of every single thing in this book, except for the stuff on evolution. And I object to that because I don't want students to be told that genetics or ecology are all figured out, or that you don't need an open mind to study molecular biology. Of course you do. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. No charge. I'll rewrite the sticker for the Cobb County Board. And the way in which I would rewrite it would come out as something like this. This book has material on science. Science is built around theories which are strongly supported by factual evidence. Everything in science should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. And if that was on the textbooks, I'd be thrilled. Now, I won't go into details, but these stickers are gone, uh, courtesy of a federal court order, although the ultimate fate of that particular court case is in doubt because the appeals court has thrown it back to the district court. But the more important point is that anti-evolution activity in the United States is nationwide. Uh, Time Magazine had a wonderful cover story just last year on the evolution wars and how they were dividing Americans, how Americans uh, handle the theory of evolution. The president, as you heard earlier, has weighed in very helpfully on this issue. Um, I and other biologists were actually thrilled that the president has taken interest in science education. I hope he continues to do that. Um, and I was particularly got a kick out of the textbook upon which they superimposed the president's face uh, in the story. And Joe and I are actually looking for new cover artwork for our book, especially in Texas. And you know, that might be it. So we're, we're, we're thinking about this very seriously. Um, in just the last 18 months, I've actually had the pleasure, if that's the right word, of testifying in federal trials in two states, in Georgia and Pennsylvania. Um, there are two other states. Uh, you already heard about Kansas but also Ohio, and you heard about Ohio from, from Lawrence Krauss, in which this has been an enormous bone of contention at the state level. If you color in the states in which an anti-evolution measure has been reported to the floor of the state legislature, you get all of these. And if you color in the states in which there's been anti-evolution activity in an organized way at the local board or district level, it is 41 of the 50 states. So don't be tempted to believe even for a second that this is a regional problem, a difficulty in flyover country, something that we nice enlightened folks on the East Coast and the West Coast are not involved with. This is a national phenomenon. So the question vis-a-vis -vis the intent of this conference is how come? Why is evolution under attack? One of my own students actually handed me this booklet once, and the occasion for handing me the booklet was when she saw me on campus, on our campus, at an Ash Wednesday service. And on the way out, she stopped me and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, same thing you are. And I had just finished a week and a half in our freshman biology course in the spring of lecturing about evolution. She said, I'm going to give you a book. It's going to explain why, if you believe all this evolution stuff, you certainly don't belong in church. 
And this was the book depicting evolution as the apple in the mouth of the serpent, a very offensive image to anyone who is a biologist and sees the central idea of the biological sciences being depicted as the apple in the mouth of the serpent. Now, why is evolution depicted this way? Is it a shaky scientific theory? I don't think so. I think there's a deeper reason. Think about what the Board of Education of Kansas did when they took evolution out of the science standards. I mean, biology has a lot of subdisciplines. If you're going to take one thing out, why would you take out evolution? Why not take out cell biology? or physiology, or for God's sakes, why not take out organic chemistry? Um, and I apologize in advance to all the chemists in the room. I know it was a cheap joke, but uh, you know, nonetheless, you ought to think about how your discipline is regarded by the reaction to it that you just heard in the crowd. Um, well, Lawrence indicated this yesterday, although I have a slightly more colorful version of the same image that he showed. This is from the largest, not a fringe group, the largest anti-evolution organization in the United States, probably in the world. It's called Answers in Genesis. These are the guys who are about to open the Creation Museum in Florence, Kentucky, a $27 million project. And the reason is because evolution is seen as the foundation of everything that's wrong in society. Lawlessness, homosexuality, pornography, abortion, whereas all this good stuff is undermined by evolution. And in the view of such folks, which, which are a large fraction of the American people, What's actually going on in the United States today is depicted here. And Lawrence showed a version of this slide as well. And that is a battle between humanism and Christianity. And the fruits of evolution are abortion, pornography, racism, euthanasia, and the breakup of families. And if you really thought that evolution was responsible for all those things or for some of those things, you might be bothered as well. That is the extent to which this is not a scientific argument, but rather a cultural war. Well, the cultural war hit ahead, I think. Um, in the end of 2004, in a school district in Pennsylvania, a very small school district called Dover, Pennsylvania, in which the Board of Education decided to instruct the teachers to start teaching something called intelligent design. As a biologist, and as also somebody who's concerned about health, as soon as I saw this picture of these students standing across from the high school, I thought, these people are not absorbing a lot of biology um, <laughs> if this is what the students are doing in their spare time. But be that as, it's met, as it may, um, the day after um, the board voted this way, this was the scoreboard, honest to God, outside Dover High School. It said, intelligent design won, Darwin nothing. And as, a, as an old baseball player, um, I looked at that. I wasn't too worried because it doesn't hurt to let the other team get a few runs ahead early on as long as you get to pile it on in the bottom of the ninth. And lo and behold, we got to pile it on in one sense or another to the bottom of the ninth. Now, something very interesting happened. When the board did this, they originally said they wanted to teach creationism. A lot of people didn't like that. Then all of a sudden, one week, they all came in and said, no, we didn't mean that. We mean intelligent design. And they instructed the teachers in Dover. There's only four biology teachers in Dover. They instructed them to prepare an intelligent design curriculum. And they came back to the board. And they said, well, we have two problems. You're going to love these. One is, you know, none of us are actually certified to teach creationism or intelligent design. So you're going to have to send us to a continuing education program where we can get certified in these subjects. And the board was confused by that. But the other response, which was more in principle, was that they all had to sign something when they became teachers in Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Teacher Code of Ethics. And part of that code is a promise in which a teacher says, I will never knowingly present false information to a student. And they told the board, this stuff is false information. We would violate our oath if we presented it to students. So the board was stymied. And um, I think this took exceptional courage in the face of losing their jobs for them to do this. Many people in the community said that the board had an anti-evolution bias and that religion was behind this intelligent design policy. They thought so even more when the board bought two classroom sets of an intelligent design textbook, I'll talk about this more later, called Of Pandas and People. And it took a few months for people in the community to realize that what the board was doing was following a playbook, a playbook called Intelligent Design in Public School Science Curricula, a legal guideline. <coughs> Pardon me. It has three authors, David DeWolf, Mark DeForest, and Stephen Meyer. Stephen Meyer is the director of the Discovery Institute. So this was a playbook that the Discovery Institute had orchestrated. And lo and behold, both this playbook, How to Get ID into Your Classroom, 
and the Intelligent Design textbook are published by an organization called the Foundation for Thought and Ethics. And this was the strategy that was being followed. Well, what happened is the Dover Board finally decided on a four-paragraph statement on intelligent design to point out these wonderful books in the school library. And they asked the teachers to read it, and the teachers still refused to read it. So what the board was reduced to doing was having the superintendent and the assistant superintendent go into the biology classroom, read these statements on intelligent design and against evolution to the students, while the teachers stood outside in the hallway. They also said no questions, and then they left. The day after that was done, what happened after the uh, teachers refused to read the ID lesson, the day after this was done, a lawsuit was filed by 11 parents in federal district court in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. These are press conferences from the day of the lawsuit. Um, this very shy and unassuming woman here in the striped blouse is Tammy Kitzmiller, K-I-T-Z Miller. She is the first listed plaintiff, so this case is known in history as Kitzmiller versus Dover. And uh, just like Lawrence Krauss, I recommend all of you to quick do a Google on Kitz Miller. You'll pull up the decision, download it, 139 pages, double space. Don't be intimidated by that. One of the most readable pieces of, of legal work that I have ever seen. Well, this was the filing of the lawsuit was in December 2004. The trial began remarkably quickly, less than a year, in federal court in Harrisburg. Salon described this as the new monkey trial. And they were also kind enough to point out that I had an indirect role along with my co-author Joe Levine in provoking it. And the reason for that is the teachers had originally said they wanted new biology textbooks and they recommended the one that Joe Levine and I had written and they said nice stuff about it, about what a wonderful thing it was and all this other sort of stuff. Um, the Board of Education's response was to look at our textbook, pronounce it as being laced with Darwinism something that we may put as a back jacket endorsement at some point or another. <laughs> um, and one of the board members said, this country wasn't founded on Muslim beliefs or evolution. This country was founded on Christianity, and our students should be taught as such. Now what that has to do with a biology textbook, I will leave to your imagination. But nonetheless, that was what happened. The trial began in September, and I had the honor, again, if you want to call it that, of being the lead witness one of six expert witness for the plaintiffs. In this case, the plaintiffs were the parents. Um, the trial was an extraordinary public event. It was literally covered everywhere. Um, it was a, a, an incredible thing to take part in it. As a scientist, um, uh, uh, nothing in my scientific training had prepared me for testifying in court, writing a deposition, being across, uh, doing a deposition, being cross-examined, and so forth. And I feel that before I go on, I have to say something. And that is that intelligent design in the context of this conflict today in the United States and the trial has a very, very specific meaning. And I don't think that it's the same meaning as you heard from Dr. Plantagenet, the previous speaker. Um, theist, I think anybody who believes in God by definition thinks that there is a transcendent intelligence in the universe. And you might express this as a view that there is an intelligent design to the universe. For what it's worth, that's what I believe too. But it turns out that is not what is actually meant by intelligent design in the context of Dover, or for that matter, anywhere in the United States today, where intelligent design is a public issue. Rather, intelligent design is the proposition that design, which means outside intelligent intervention, is required to account for the origins of living things. And this distinguishes what we call ID today from these general considerations of meaning and purpose in the universe, with which I would agree, and actually makes intelligent design a doctrine of good old fashioned special creation, a word that was widely understood in the first half of the 20th century to mean the direct and miraculous creation of living organisms. Now I want to make this point. Intelligent design is indeed the claim that complex objects in the living world were in fact designed. This is from the website of the Discovery Institute where they define what intelligent design is and what design theorists actually do. And they point to this object in nature, and they say that this, they think this object was intelligently designed. I don't know how many of you been, have been there. I've been there. I think they're right about that. I think this object was intelligently designed and was executed by creators and so forth. And they say, well, if we can tell that's designed, then we can look at complex cellular structures, like this representation of the little rotary engine that powers the bacterial flagellum, and we can say, if that had a designer, that must have had a designer as well. 
Now, laying the argument aside for a second, what does design have to do with creation? Well, the answer is actually very simple. This is the designer of Mount Rushmore. It's the American sculptor Gutzon Borglum actually working on his design. We would not know that Mount Rushmore had been designed if, in fact, it had stayed as a design. It might have been lost or captured in his studio or just forgotten. But that design was put into practice by a series of creators. The creators were the engineers, the stonecutters, the sculptors, who actually took that design and put it into action. Therefore, Mount Rushmore is not just an act of design, it is an act of creation. By the same token, every time these folks point to complex objects in the living cell, the animals of the Cambrian explosion, complex proteins, the cilium, the flagellum, the blood clotting pathway and say they were designed, what they actually mean was that at a certain point in natural history, all of these things were created by supernatural intervention out of nothing. And since we know the natural history of this planet, these creation events took place at specific times. This is what makes intelligent design a theory of special creation. You can't have design without creation and have a physical object as a result. Now, when the Dover case was looming, in early 2005, we knew it was. The intelligent design folks were salivating at the chance to confront Darwinists like me in the courtroom. And they were particularly salivating because they drew, by sheer luck, by random chance, a judge named John Jones. They knew ahead of time Judge Jones was a very conservative judge. He's a lifelong Republican. He was a political protege of Governor Tom Ridge of Pennsylvania, President Bush's first Secretary of Homeland Security. And it also turns out he was recommended, think about this, he was recommended for the federal bench by his state senator, Rick Santora. And he was appointed to the federal bench by George W. Bush and unanimously confirmed by the Senate. So they have a very, uh, they have a strict constructionist basically in here in this case. And uh, no less a person than William Dembski, one of the leading theorists of intelligent design, in May of last year just was so excited about this prospect. Um, and he said, you know, we had hearings in Kansas, but the evolutionists never showed up. But I want to have a trial. And in the trial, we're going to execute something that Dembski called the vice strategy. We're going to squeeze the truth out of Darwinists. And what he wrote on his blog, and it's still up there, was I await the day when hearings aren't voluntary, but involve subpoenas that compel evolutionists to be deposed and interrogated. There are ways for this to happen, and the wheels are in motion. Indeed, they were, because he could see the coming lawsuit in Dover. What I proposed then, coming trial, because the lawsuit had already been filed, is a strategy for interrogating the Darwinists to squeeze the truth out. Now, you can't make this stuff up. Dembski took these pictures and put them on his website. <coughs> and they are still there. And you can see the strategy for squeezing the truth out of Darwinists. So this is bold stuff. So you'd think that when the trial actually came and people like me had to be under oath, he would have been really excited. Initially, I think he might have been. Because it turns out, once this was filed, the defense, the school board, filed a panel of eight expert witnesses. Almost all of them fellows from the Discovery Institute, including Dembski and Michael Behe, who's at Lehigh University, and all sorts of other people. A funny thing happened on the way to the trial, though. Even though all of these people filed expert statements, the papers to appear in court, at the time to be deposed before trial, the lawyers walked into the room for Dembski to be deposed, and he wasn't there. An attorney walked in and said, Dr. Dembski has withdrawn from the case. Have a good day. Then what happens is Stephen Meyer, the director of the Discovery Institute, he withdrew from the case. And one after another after another, five of the eight expert witnesses under pressure, it is very clear from the Discovery Institute, withdrew from the case, leaving just three expert witnesses. I'm still amazed every time I we read Dembski's blog about how exciting it will be to get the Darwinists under oath because he apparently was not willing to go under oath himself. Well, when the trial actually took place, um, it started on a Monday. I thought my testimony would be pretty simple. I'd show up, I'd give my testimony, I'd be cross-examined, I'd be done Monday, I'd fly back to Providence, I'd teach my cell biology lecture Tuesday afternoon. Didn't work out the way I expected. My cross-examination went on and on on Monday, 
and I spent most of the day on Tuesday on stand as well. So I had to do something I've almost never done, which is to cancel a scheduled lecture. So I emailed all my students in my cell bio class. I sent them a copy of the Science Magazine article about the trial so they would know their professor, you know, it's not like off skiing or something like that. This is for real. I sent them a link to the New York Times article and my testimony. I guess they thought that was okay. But I have to tell you the truth. They were not really impressed until they saw that the trial was being covered in the ultimate news source by the standards of today's collegians. And I'm sure you all know what that ultimate news source is. It's right there. It's The Daily Show by John Stewart. Um, and once my students saw that, indeed, it was The Daily Show, they were really impressed. By the end of the year, in January this year, they got even more impressed because it turns out that not just the trial, uh, but the first witness was actually covered in the Colbert Report. And I appeared as a guest on the Colbert Report. Um, and later on, in a few minutes, I'll show you a little clip from that that I have a feeling you, you, may, you may enjoy. Now, one of the interesting things about this trial is that its critics often like to pretend that this was a decision that hinged on the personal opinions of a single judge who, of course, in their view, got it wrong. But the people of Dover watched this trial, too. And after the trial ended, before, a month before, the judge filed his opinion, there was a school board election in Dover. And guess what the voters in, Do voted Do in Dover did? They threw out the entire Board of Education. In short, the testimony of the trial, not the judge's decision, the testimony of the trial convinced them that this school board was off its rocker, and they voted in a new pro-science slate that actually includes three of the plaintiffs on that lawsuit. And this is one of the reasons why the, why the, the Dover decision will not be appealed. Just before Christmas, Judge Jones published his decision. It was a stinging rebuke of intelligent design. And in particular, it argued that there was clear evidence that intelligent design is religious, and not just religious per se, but it advocates a particular version of Christianity, which coincidentally doesn't happen to, happen to be mine. It doesn't happen to be the version advocated by other people in this room. And therefore, it amounted to state advocacy of a particular religious point of view. Um, once again, I urge you to read this decision. It is an eminently readable, and it is extraordinary. Now, what actually happened at the trial? <coughs> Excuse me. The trial went on for almost seven weeks. Actually, the trial went on for 40 days, and it led the judge to claim <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights. It's absolutely true. Um, there was, I think, an extraordinary team of attorneys involved in the trial. Uh, there were three of them for our side, one Eric Rothschild, was the lead attorney. He was doing this pro bono. He's a private lawyer. He convinced his firm to take on this case for free. The Board of Education was defended by the Thomas More Legal Foundation, a legal foundation that says on its website that it protects the religious free expression rights of Christians. Um, and the legal talent on both sides was considerable. Um, I would argue that we learned two things from the trial. One is we saw firsthand the complete collapse of intelligent design as anything resembling a scientific theory. And then finally, its exposure as a religious doctrine, pardon me, masquerading as science. And I want to show you what I mean by that. Um, arguments made by intelligent design advocates that presented the fossil record as a problem for evolution failed, and they failed totally. The National Academy of Sciences actually years ago had tried to point this out. You hear people say there's no such thing as an intermediate form in the fossil record. NIS said, now come on. There's so many intermediate forms between fish and amphibians, reptiles and mammals along the primate line that the really hard part is often to identify where the transition occurs from one species to another. And if you have trouble doing that, then obviously there are plenty of intermediate or transitional forms in the fossil record. But I always think it's good to talk about specific cases. The other scientist who was an expert witness was Kevin Padian from Berkeley. And Kevin talked about the fossil evidence. He used a lot of evidence to show this. And I just want to show one. We've known for a very long time, with thanks, by the way, to Carl Zimmer, who's in the audience and from whose book this was swiped. Um, we've known for a long time that cetaceans, whales and dolphins, descended from terrestrial mammals perhaps 80 or 90 or 70 million years ago. And the earliest whale known about 25 years ago, Basilosaurus, was an unmistakable intermediate form. It still had a pelvic girdle. Some fossil specimens have, have uh, rear limbs. And it even, even lacks a blowhole because it, it breathed through the tip of the nose. The nares had not yet moved back to the center of the head. So it clearly was transitional. But critics of evolution would say, well, that's cool. But if this really happened, there ought to be a whole bunch of intermediate forms on there. Where are they? 
and they ought to be animals that were sort of intermediate between the land and the water. And in some cases, they actually ridiculed the notion that an organism could be viable and live part of the time on land and part of the time in the water. Now, they stopped ridiculing that probably about 15 years ago when paleontologists began to dig, dig, dig up fossils like this that looked remarkably like the organisms that they claimed could never have existed. One of these fossils is, has a wonderful name for those of you who are up on your Latin of Ambulocetus natans. Ambulocetus is the walking whale. Natans is who swims. And this was indeed the walking whale who swims. So you might say, well, cool. Now we have one intermediate form to plug in here. But the interesting thing is these fossils were discovered in the area from the Middle East to the Indus River between India and Pakistan. Paleontologists immediately realized that's where the transition took place. And they went to that area and started digging. And what they discovered was that's not the only one. We now have not one, not two, not three, but a total of five intermediate forms that document quite brilliantly how these mammals actually evolved and how they made this transition. Now, what do evolutionary biologists do? Do they say, cool, we've proved our case and stop looking? Of course not. Every scientist in this room knows how annoyingly self-critical the scientific enterprise is. So if this is indeed an authentic transition, you know what should have happened? These animals, of course, were adapted to live on land. So they had a hearing apparatus good for the air. These guys were adapted to hear underwater. And that means they have an entirely different hearing apparatus. If you've ever done scuba or skin driving, you know that your hearing underwater really sucks. I mean, you can hear stuff, but you have no idea where it's coming from. That's because, again, our auditory apparatus works in air. These guys are so good underwater, they can use this as sonar. So if this is a real transition, we ought to be able to dissect the skulls one way or another of these fossils and find intermediate forms in which the bones of the middle ear were in the process of being rearranged for good hearing underwater. And guess what? Two years ago, there was a study in Nature that used CAT scanning, CT scanning, to actually go into the skulls, visualize the middle ear bones, and lo and behold, what these studies show is that indeed these intermediate forms actually exist. So even when you probe this record by looking at the details to see does it still support evolution, the answer is, of course, it does. And as all of you know who follow the news, this hasn't stopped. We keep finding new and, for a creationist, very embarrassing fossils. Here, for example, is an article from that noted left-wing propaganda magazine, The Wall Street Journal, pointing out two big news discoveries in evolutionary theory. One was biochemical, the other one was paleontological, and that is the discovery of yet another, because we already had plenty, yet another intermediate form documenting how the vertebrate limb evolved from the limbs of, uh, of lobe-finned fishes. So this case gets better and better all the time. If you ever needed proof that God exists, here it is. Two weeks before the trial started, Nature published the chimpanzee genome sequence. And as soon as I opened it, I said, this is a gift from God. We have to take this into the courtroom. Um, but this is pretty complicated stuff. Even though the lead article, the author actually says that Charles Darwin and Thomas Henry Huxley could not have imagined a better confirmation of evolution than the DNA sequence of the chimpanzee. And that was absolutely true. But we realized we're going to bring this into the courtroom, but we have to find a way to get it down to a level that a judge can understand. Now, what we mean by that is very simple. I mean no disrespect by that. I mean someone who's intelligent and is well-trained, but is not trained in science. So we wanted to make a scientific argument in a way that someone whose training was in the law would not get lost in. And I think we found exactly the way to do it. Um, it turns out that, that we, we've known for a long time that we share common ancestors with the other great apes, animals like the gorilla, the orang, and the chimp. But there's something really interesting about this common ancestry, and that is we humans have 46 chromosomes. All the other great apes have 48. Now, if you're not a biologist, you should remember that we get, oh, those 46 chromosomes are actually 23 pairs. We each got 23 from mom and 23 from dad, so a baby chimp got 24 from its mom and 24 from its dad. So what happened to our chromosome? Are we missing a pair of chromosomes? Could it be that in the lineage leading to us, suddenly a chromosome pair just vanished? It got tangled up or got messed up? The answer is no. And that is we know enough about primate genetics to know that the loss of an entire chromosome pair would be fatal. That organism would never get through embryonic development. So there's really only one possibility, and it's a testable one. And that is in the lineage leading to us, 
two primate chromosomes must have gotten accidentally stuck together to form one of our chromosomes. That makes the hypothesis of common ancestry testable. If we really do share common ancestry with these guys, we ought to be able to look at the human genome and identify a single chromosome that resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. And you know, if we can't find it, it would tend to falsify the hypothesis of common ancestry. This is what we mean about evolution making testable predictions. Now, how would you find that? And again, if you're not a biologist, ask a biology student in the room. They'll explain this to you. Chromosomes have very special DNA sequences at the tips called telomeres. They're only found at the tips. And they have special sequences at the center called centromeres. If two chromosomes got fused to form one of ours, you know what you'd find? You would find telomeres where they don't belong, right in the middle of that fused chromosome. And you'd also find a chromosome with two centromeres. Now, it could be that one of those centromeres might become inactivated, uh, centromere number one or centromere number two. That would make the fused chromosome a little more stable. But we still ought to be able to find it. So what happens? If we look at the human genome, do we find a fused chromosome? Well, the answer turns out to be yes. And it turns out to be chromosome number two. This is an article last year from Nature. And I'm going to read this, even though we've got a lot of scientific jargon in it. Chromosome two is unique to the human lineage. It emerged as a result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two chromosomes that are still separate in other primates. If you're not a geneticist and you haven't followed how much we know about our own genome, this may come as a surprise to you. The precise fusion site is between bases 114,455,823 and 114,455,838. It's a 15, <coughs> excuse me, a 15 base pair region where you can actually see the scotch tape that's holding these two chromosomes together. The telomere duplications are right there, right there where they belong. And during the formation, one of the two centromeres, sure enough, became inactivated. The inactive one corresponds to chimp chromosome 13, and the active one corresponds to chimp chromosome 12. There is no way to explain this data in light of special creation or intelligent design, unless you, are wish, to, unless you wish to postulate an intelligent designer who said, we're going to give them a chromosome number two that looks like it was pasted together just to fool them as to the nature of their ancestry. And frankly, if you're willing to believe in that kind of a designer, well, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you later on today. Um, so clearly, this is dramatic confirmation of the hypothesis of common ancestry uh, for our species, and it's important. The other thing that happened at trial is the favorite stories of intelligent design with respect to things that evolution can't explain. They were all refuted. And this was actually part of my testimony. These include things like the bacterial flagellum, the blood clotting cascade, and the generation of biological information. Because I have other topics I want to talk about, I can't go into all of these, but I'll give you a highlight of this. The bacterial flagellum, for those of you who don't know it, is this marvelous little microscopic machine composed of about 30, 35 protein parts. It's an acid-powered rotary engine. It's cool stuff. It's enormously complex, and they say, you know, this could never have evolved because its set of protein parts is irreducibly complex. These parts are only used for the flagellum, nothing else. Evolution would require that two or three of the parts evolve for one purpose and five or six for another purpose, and somehow they all be put together. But they assert that these parts are only used for flagellar motility. Only a designer could have crafted them, snapped them together, and endowed this organism with this capacity. But the problem is, a detailed analysis shows that's wrong. That's just not true. The bacterial flagellum actually contains parts that are homologous to other system, systems. And a lot of this work actually was done at Yale by the late uh, Rob McMahon, who did brilliant work on this particular system. Ten of these proteins, for example, are related to the type 3 secretory apparatus, which is a nasty little molecular syringe that bacteria use to pump poisons into our cells. Nothing to do with motility, but they fit in the base plate of this guy. And furthermore, just about every other protein that's in here is actually part of an entirely different system in the cell. So what that means is, when you actually analyze this and look at this, and you analyze the parts closely, it is entirely consistent with an evolutionary explanation in which complex biochemical machines arise by combining parts of other machines that have other functions, and the parts originate with different functions. So a very careful analysis of the bacterial flagellum, and there's a new article that has just come out in Nature Microbiology supporting this idea, 
matches evolutionary theory, not the intelligent design special creation model. Um, I have to tell you, though, that one of the most dramatic moments in the trial concerned not the bacterial flagellum, but the immune system. All of us have an immune system that makes it possible for us to fight diseases in many ways. We can make antibodies, proteins that help us fight off infection, to just about anything that gets into our body. The key to this is a gene shuffling system that can swap little pieces of DNA and make literally millions of different types of antibody. Where did this system come from? Well, Michael Behe, one of the witnesses at the trial for intelligent design, said wherever the system came from, it didn't come from evolution. And the reason for that is it has multiple parts. He said, don't even bother to try to explain it in Darwinian terms. It, it would be a work akin to the myth of Sisyphus. You'd never be able to do it. And he went further. The reason is because this system of gene shuffling has multiple parts. And if you don't have all the parts together at exactly the same time, the system simply will not work. In, in other words, all the components would be pointless. Now, he wrote this in 1996, about 10 years ago. And that was a very straightforward prediction. And from my point of view, it's one of the things that's wrong with intelligent design. It looks at complicated systems and says, don't bother. You'll never figure them out by evolution. Well, this, from Behe's point of view, I think was probably a most unfortunate prediction. Because in the intervening decade, literally hundreds of papers have confirmed every single element of what is called the transposon hypothesis of this gene shuffling system in terms of evolution. And not only do we know how it has evolved, we also can trace its ancestry of various parts in a whole series of organisms. This is extraordinary stuff. So what has happened in those intervening 10 years is we have traced the evolution of every single step of the immune system. Here, for example, a very important review article in PNAS, the descent of this immune system by gradual evolution. We know exactly how it's happened. And we understand it so well that it even ends up in Scientific American, which is the mark of something that the scientific community thinks is pretty well figured out. Now, how do you bring this reality into a courtroom? Well, I'm not an attorney, and I wouldn't have thought of doing it this way, but that's why I'm not an attorney. Eric Rothschild um, took a bibliography that Nick Matsky from the National Center for Science Education and I assembled for him of a total of, I forget, 57 or 58 published papers on the evolution of the immune system. Put Dr. Behe on the stand, one paper at a time, set the papers in front of him. Reminded him of his claim that we'd never be able to understand the evolution of the immune system, and said, Dr. Behe, how about this paper? Dr. Behe said, I, the evidence there is not good enough for me. It leaves, OK, fine. Dr. Behe, how about this paper? I haven't read that one. Uh, Dr. Behe, how about this paper? Well, I've heard about that, but that's one after another after another, until he piled up all of these papers, nine books on the evolution of the immune system, and several medical school textbooks. Dr. Behe is not especially tall. And Eric Rothschild told me that he purposely piled these up on the witness stand in front of Dr. Behe, and then he kept ducking behind it so that Dr. Behe had to look first to one side and then to the other side. And finally, with this, and this was the pile, when the pile was completely assembled, at one point he had to turn to the judge and say, Your Honor, may I push this evidence off to one side? And that in itself was exactly <laughs> That was exactly the effect that the attorney was looking for. Perry Mason has nothing on Eric Rothschild. And the judge, this made the impression on the judge. Um, it says B was presented with all these publications, all these books, all these textbooks. But he just simply insisted this still isn't sufficient evidence of evolution, and it wasn't good enough for him. And the point was made that this is an argument that persists not because of the evidence, but in spite of the evidence against it. And this was a powerful point. Second thing, as I mentioned before, that the trial did was to expose intelligent design as a particular religious doctrine masquerading as science. Now, how did that happen? After all, if you look at the statement that the Dover Board of Education wrote, which is shown right here, there's nothing in there about God. There's nothing in there about the Bible. It doesn't sound religious on its surface. It simply says Darwin's theory is a theory. There is gaps in the theory and all this other sort of stuff intelligent design, different explanations, take a look at it, and so forth. Well, we, in other words, people like me, we didn't have to make the case that intelligent design was religious. It wasn't a problem. You want to know who made the case? The expert witnesses for the other side. This is Michael Behe from Lehigh University. It turns out Michael Behe has written that intelligent design means not designed by the laws of nature, 
and that it is implausible that the designer is natural, therefore the designer is supernatural. Second expert witness, Scott Minnick, said if ID is science, we're going to have to change the ground rules of science to make supernatural forces part of science. And finally, Steve Fuller said the whole project of intelligent design is to change the ground rules of science to include the supernatural. So the attorneys told me they got these guys on the stand. It was just a matter of keep talking. Tell us all you think about this. And they made the case that this is indeed an inherently religious idea. Now, is that a bad thing? In other words, what would happen if we did redefine science to include intelligent design? We might think, well, that's good. It's a useful idea people are concerned about. Let's see what happens. Well, Behe was asked about that. And uh, I don't know about you, but the first time I read this transcript, I just fell on the floor. Um, he basically said his definition of theory that would be required for ID to be admitted is so broad that it would include astrology. And the attorney asked him basically, Dr. Behe, are you certain that you mean that? And the answer is absolutely. And the court actually broke out in laughter. It was very funny to see this person saying, yes, under my definition, astrology would count as a science. And every time I've had a chance to speak to a teacher's group, I ask them to remind their board members, their administrators, and people in their community that during this trial, the leading scientist in favor of intelligent design under oath testified that for intelligent design to be considered science, you'd have to fit astrology into the same definition. And most people, certainly most Christians, don't want astrology taught in their schools at all. And they certainly don't want astrology taught as science. But as it turns out, folks, it gets better. The textbook presented for intelligent design, the history of this textbook literally closed the case. Um, this textbook doesn't say anything about God, Genesis, or the Bible. So it sounds scientific. And I want to show you how scientific it sounds. This is the definition, the very definition, not obscure remark, of intelligent design. ID means the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings. Very scientific. That's what ID is. Okay. Our attorneys executed a subpoena on the publisher of this book. And they said, well, that's interesting. Could you send us, they had to send them, because it was a subpoena, previous editions, earlier copies, copies under different names, page proofs, editorial drafts. And the attorneys actually called me up and they said, Ken, we got two boxes of stuff from these guys and you aren't going to believe what's in it. And my first reaction was, didn't these guys learn anything from the Nixon administration? I mean, you've got to burn this stuff. But they didn't burn it. And guess what we found? What we found is that this book existed as an earlier version with a different name called Biology and Origins. Here's just one paragraph. Watch this. Creation means the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent creator. Distinctive features are intact. Fish with it, it's the same paragraph. And all these guys did was to fire up a word processor and change creator to designer, change creation to intelligent design, and there it was. And suddenly it was an ID textbook. When people say intelligent design is fundamentally different from creation science, point this out to them. Now, one of the heroes of the case, as far as I'm concerned, is a philosopher of science at southwestern Louisiana named Barbara Forrest. It was Barbara's idea to get the history of this book. And Barbara sat down, and she counted with some help from the National Center for Science Education. Every time words like creation appeared in the early versions of the book, and every time intelligent design, and ideas in blue, creations in red. Right up to early 1987, ID is barely mentioned, and it's all about creationism. Watch this. Um, all of a sudden, in 1987, <laughs> creation drops right off the map, and it's all about ID. And what this tells you is clearly something absolutely remarkable happened in the middle of the year 1987. And I'll bet you that a lot of you in the audience already know what that was that happened in 1987. This is a timeline of litigation with regard to the teaching of evolution in the schools. 1987 was Edwards versus Aguilar, the Supreme Court case that identified creation science as religion and therefore unacceptable for public education. And bingo, within two weeks, they were fired up the word processor and they were making these changes. It was very clear to the judge. In fact, it was clear to any reasonable person that intelligent design was literally just a cover story, a change of names from the same creation science arguments that had been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. This is the collapse of intelligent design. And when the judge ruled that this case was not science, 
There was a celebration in Harrisburg and Dover among all the people involved in this case. And I'm very happy, I'm unhappy to say I couldn't make it to Harrisburg that day I had to teach, but I am happy to say at subsequent meetings, all of us involved in the case, the parents, the teachers, the volunteer attorneys and the witnesses, we've all gotten together and we've lifted more than one or two glasses of strong drink to celebrate this and it has been an absolute pleasure. It was an extraordinary thing. The second part of my talk though, don't worry, I'm way more than halfway through it. The second part of what I wanted to talk about was what does this mean for faith? Um, this is obviously a great victory for evolution and a defeat for the idea of intelligent design. So what does it mean? Does it mean, for example, that the legacy of Darwin, which some people would say tells us that we are just prisoners of chemistry and physics, the meaningless result of chance encounters in a pointless, purposeless universe, that this point of view is triumphant. Um, you heard some quotations. Our oh, guest hey, is hey, a... Back. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. What I wanted to show you is this issue, that science and religion are in direct conflict, is almost always the first issue that is raised in opposition to evolution. And I wanted to show you an edited version of the Colbert Report that indicates exactly how powerful that opposition is. Our guest is a professor of biology at Brown University and a leading critic of intelligent design. I'm going to ask him where he gets off. Please welcome Ken Miller. so much for doing the show. This is such a thrill here. for me. It's a thrill for me. Let me ask you something. Walk me through, I want to give you a shot here. <laughs> Explain evolution from the primordial soup to how I got here today in my limo. Oh, well that's it. <laughs> Walk me through it. Take uh, 30 seconds. Okay. How about if we crawl? Basically what evolution tells us is that we are united, we're put together in a fabric of life with every other living thing on this planet. Uh -huh. um, up until about, oh, two, three hundred years ago, people thought that life on Earth had never changed. But they immediately became aware at the end of the 17th and 18th century that life had changed. And the process of change, explaining that, has been one of biology's biggest projects for the last 150 years. And that explanation is evolution. But, uh, what the speaking of designers, uh, you're a Catholic. Yes, sir. I am a Catholic also. Have you forgot the creed? Jesus, through him, all things were made. For us men and for our salvation. I remember exactly. all this very well. Okay. But there's so also... don't you see a conflict there? You've got to choose. No, there's not a conflict. There's not a conflict. There isn't? And you don't have to choose. And here's the problem. The biggest thing that the opponents of evolution have going for them is a fiction. It's not true. And that is the idea that evolution and religion have to be in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. What it amounts to, in a sense, is that I have a higher opinion of God than the people who favor intelligent design. Because they think he's sort of a little pedestrian god who has a lot of cheap tricks. He had to design this. Whoops, it went extinct. He designed that. It went extinct. The fossil museums of the world are filled with his mistakes. My view is that I've got a higher opinion. This is a guy who was so clever that he set a process in motion that gave rise to everything on this planet, and you and me, and maybe even Bill O'Reilly. You know what? <laughs> I, I agree with you about O'Reilly. <laughs> right? I think O'Reilly could be so involved that he's one of the X-Men. Okay, no, let, 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 let me ask you something. You think God is that clever. I think God is so clever that he just made it look like there's a fossil record. So, so you, isn't God powerful enough that he just sort of put all those dino bones down in there to give us the illusion we've been here for a while? Well, in so, fact, nothing existed before I was born. So, so... Your, your theory is essentially what I would call the Steve Martin theory of evolution, mm -hmm. which is that God put all these things down here just to show us he's a wild and crazy God. Well, I don't reject that for scientific reasons. I reject it for theological ones, which is that I don't choose to believe in a deceptive creator. Um, Mr. Miller, will you come back? We've got to go now, but will you please come back on another show and explain to me this whole sun doesn't go around the earth thing? We'll work on it. Okay. Ken Miller, thank you so much. I think you should be applauding for Stephen Colbert, who is an extraordinary person, extraordinary performer. Um, but look how quickly, I edited some of that to make it short, but look how quickly he says, don't you see a problem there? You've got to choose. And that's the essence of the, uh, of the conflict. And it turns out, 
an intentional strategy of the intelligent design movement is to uh, depict evolution and religion as being in inherent conflict. Philip Johnson has said the whole idea of our strategy is to convince people that Darwinism is atheistic. That will shift the debate from creation versus evolution to the existence of God versus the non-existent. And then we can accomplish our theological aims. It's very straightforward, very clear that the strategy about evolution is fundamentally <coughs> excuse me, a theological strategy. Now, there is, in fact, no shortage of scientists who are willing to help him in that project. David Hull, writing in Nature a few years ago, said whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory might be, he's not the Protestant God of waste not what not. He's not a loving God who cares about his productions. He isn't even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of the Galapagos, the God of evolution, is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He certainly is not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined. In, in short, God, if he exists, is a very nasty fellow. I never realized that one could use science to make conclusions about the personality of God, but that's exactly what David Hall has done in this quotation. A famous quote from Richard Dawkins is that the universe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless, indifferent. I think Richard has written three or four books trying to dig his way out from the import of that quotation, in part because he thinks there is purpose, it's just not purpose to the universe. Um, but nonetheless, this sort of statement on behalf of evolutionary uh, uh, titans like Richard Dawkins uh, fans the flame of the notion that evolution is inherently contradictory to religion. And assertions like these, and I could ring a whole, read a whole string of them, as you know, actually have an assertion built into them. And that is that science alone, scientism, can lead us to truth regarding the purpose of existence, which is, of course, that it does not have a purpose. Now, the reality to statements like this is they might be true, but they're philosophical and not scientific in nature. And when I say philosophical, I don't mean wrong. I simply mean not testable by the methods of science. And therefore, they have no more scientific standing than a faith-based assertion that I might make about the wonderful nature of existence. That wouldn't be scientific either, but I would be as entitled to believe it as Richard Dawkins would be entitled to believe what he says about this sort of stuff. Now, the wonders of computers and electronics are such that you can make things up at the last minute. So when I heard the previous speaker, I thought that was a wonderful quote he used from Dennett. The living world, he said, was produced, Dennett, was produced by natural selection, a process that creates design out of chaos without the aid of mind. And I thought that is a remarkable quote, but my reaction to Dennett's quote is this, which is to say a creator of such chaos as Dennett refers to, a chaos endowed with the ability, as Dennett agrees, to support the process of natural selection, which created a living world of endless variety and beauty, would seem to me to deserve a certain amount of credit for creating such creative chaos. And therefore, the implications that Dennett and I might draw from the same elements of evolutionary theory are and justifiably can be uh, entirely different. Now, what's going on? What is at the heart of the conflict, the debate, the struggle between science and religion? My analysis is a simple one, but I think it's also one that adheres very closely to the facts. We in biology have a scientific theory, and that is the origin of species, including our own, by material processes. Um, many people, and two recent examples of this are Richard Dawkins' forthcoming book, The God Delusion, and Daniel Dennett's book, Breaking the Spell, use evolutionary theory to draw conclusions which are against theism. These conclusions are based uh, on philosophical naturalism, namely they, are the, uh, they include the contention that material origins deny meaning, deny purpose, and deny a deity. Now, people who wish to defend their religious ideas, including scientific creationists, have looked at this. And ironically, I think they have ignored the philosophical naturalism of the conclusion. And they've instead said, boy, what we've got to do is to defend religion by going after evolution itself, knowing that if they can disprove evolution by providing an alternative, this philosophical construct will collapse of its own weight. Therefore, scientific creationism has attacked evolution. When intelligent design came along, Literally, everyone in the scientific community realized this was the same as scientific creationism. And why did we think that? 
it was because what intelligent design sought to do was the exact same thing, to argue that evolution doesn't work. Many people have actually told me that they think that people like Michael Behe actually support evolution. They just want a little bit of fine tuning from an intelligent designer. There's a passage at the front of Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box, in which Behe says, for the Darwinian theory of evolution to be true, it must account for the biochemical complexity of the living cell. It is the purpose of this book to show that it does not. That's as clear a statement as I can think of, that Michael Behe and intelligent design is anti-evolution in its heart and in its soul. Now, what's happening here, I would argue, is that people of faith who embrace these anti-scientific ideas are misguided, and they haven't really thought about the relationship between evolution as science and the anti-theism that many people draw from it. And I think a more correct way for people of faith, people like me, who are concerned about this interpretation is to recognize that evolution is profoundly strong science. It's the basis of almost everything we do in the life sciences. And what they should take issue with is this anti-theistic interpretation. Now, how should they take issue with this? Not by attacking individuals, not by saying, that they're full of it or, or speculating as more than one intelligent design person has done of the pleasure he's going to have watching Richard Dawkins spend eternity in a very, very hot place, which uh, strikes me as a profoundly unchristian attitude, but rather by providing an alternate explanation in which you have a philosophical uh, interpretation in which the material origins of our species actually reveal the meaning, the purpose, and perhaps the deity behind them. Now, many of you may say, well, I, I certainly am not buying that. That's not science. It's not science, but neither is this. And the tradition in which I make these arguments is actually in a tradition of a previous Terry lecturer, namely John Polkinghorn, who bundled a series of absolutely marvelous Terry lectures a few years ago into a book called Belief in God in an Age of Science, a book that I would recommend to anyone interested in serious scientific and philosophical discussion of this issue. The key question is whether science carries us as deeply into the mystery of life as we truly wish to go. And many people of faith would argue that it does not. Now saying that you don't think science answers all of the things in the mystery of life, that's not a rejection of science. I'm a scientist, I've spent my life in science. I don't reject science, but I recognize that it has limitations. And I would argue in front of this distinguished group that an understanding of the validity of this choice, you don't have to agree with it, but the validity of the choice means you think it's something upon which reasonable people can differ and discuss among themselves is the first step, to, the first step that must be taken to make a genuine peace between science and religion, a peace which I think is much to be desired. Does that mean that we have to read the Bible as a scientific text? The answer is, of course not. But I'm not the first person to say that. This is an extraordinary passage from St. Augustine, written at the beginning of the fifth century. And look what Augustine said. You can read this yourself. But as you read it, I'm going to translate this into 21st century English. Even a non-believer can study geology, astronomy, zoology, botany, and other disciplines, and can gain scientific knowledge from observation and experiment. Now, the worst thing that could happen would be for a non-believer to hear a Christian, presumably explaining what the Bible means, talking nonsense on these scientific topics and we have to do everything we can to keep people from doing this, lest the non-believer reject what is really important, which is the spiritual message of the scriptures. Augustine realized that if you read scripture as science and you're wrong, the non-believer is going to throw the whole book out. And Augustine regarded that as a tragedy. So if you want the endorsement of one of the early fathers of the church for the notion that the Bible is not to be read as empirical science, it's St. Augustine, whatever else you think about Augustine, he wasn't an apologist for Charles Darwin, not living in 411 AD. Now, every now and then when I talk to scientific groups, they get a little nervous and they figure, well, we like this guy now, but uh, up until now, but now he's talking about Augustine. What kind of science would you get if you followed the precepts of some weird fifth century mystic like Augustine? That's pretty scary. That's a fair question. And I think it deserves a fair answer. And a good answer would be by taking a person who spent his life in a religious order found it according to the precepts of St. Augustine, steeped in Augustinian teaching. Now, how did this guy do? This guy was ordained in the priesthood. He did very well in religious life. He actually became the abbot, the head guy of the Augustinian monastery of St. Thomas in Brunn, 
in what is now the Czech Republic. And at one point in his life, he got interested in what today we would call a scientific question. He wanted to understand how plants passed along their characteristics from one generation to another. So how did he get his answer? Did he pray? Of course he prayed. He had to pray every day for the Roman office. Did he read scripture? Of course he did. He read scripture every day. It was part of his priestly duties. But when it came to answer the scientific question, you know what he did? He went into the garden and he did experiments. For those of you who haven't recognized him, that's Gregor Mendel. He's the founder of the modern science of genetics. What kind of science do you get if you follow Augustinian precepts? You get damn good science. You get genetics. And that's the point that I would like to make about the ultimate compatibility of science and religion. There's a letter in this week's issue of Nature pointing out that no less a distinguished scientist and geneticist than Theodosius Dobsansky, who famously said that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, once said that he is a creationist and an evolutionist. And that is because evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. I'm happy to associate myself with Dobsansky. Um, in a contemporary session, in a sense, I'm happy to associate myself with another very distinguished scientist, Francis Collins. Francis Collins is the head of the Human Genome Project, one of the most important scientists in the world, one of the people welcomed at the White House along with Craig Ventner for the ultimate success of the Human Genome Project. Francis Collins, here's a picture of him and Craig on the cover of Time, has recently written a book called The Language of God. Francis Collins is a deeply religious and committed Christian and a firm and uncompromising evolutionist who argues very powerfully that these religious and scientific beliefs are complementary and not contradictory. One of my genetics, genetics friends sent me this particular description a couple months ago and said, Ken, I want you to guess who wrote this. And this is too much of a slide to ask an audience to read, but I'll skim through it very quickly. It says, the uh, a universe erupted 15 billion years ago, Big Bang. Uh, Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago. No consensus about exactly how the first microscopic life originated, but general agreement that life first dwelt on this planet about 3.5 billion years ago. Since it has been demonstrated that all living organisms on Earth are genetically related, it is virtually certain that all living organisms have descended from this first organism. I don't know if any of you have any idea who wrote it, but the answer is this guy. It turns out to be two years ago, when he was at the time Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, he presided over a report from the International Theological Commission called Communion and Stewardship, in which he wrote this paragraph, which is as good a summary in one paragraph of the natural history of our planet as anything I have ever seen. And he went further because the committee which he presided over recognized what was going on in the United States in terms of the debate about evolution and intelligent design. And he pointed out that a lot of the critics of evolution have concluded that if evolution is a contingent, random, material process, it rules out God. So you have people like Daniel Dennett and Philip Johnson agreeing that this can rule out God. But Benedict says, wait a minute. According to our understanding of divine causality, true contingency, randomness, unpredictability, in the created order is not incompatible with a purposeful divine providence. Thus, even the outcome of a truly contingent natural process, like evolution, can nonetheless fall within God's providential plan for creation. And his theological source for this in the references is Thomas Aquinas' insight that God is ultimately, God if he exists, is the cause of causes, being the cause of nature itself. Now the Catholic Church has been battling with this for the last year or so, as many of you may know from some of the things that have been read. Um, the Vatican actually invited an article by a distinguished biologist in the Vatican newspaper, Observatory Romano, condemning intelligent design as bad theology and worse science. We all know the Pope took a little retreat uh, weekend before last with his ex-PhD students to consider evolution. An awful lot of people discovering that were really rooting for an anti-evolution statement to come out of the seminar. It seems unlikely to do that, and nature suggests that the Catholic Church is ready to reject intelligent design, and I sure hope it does. The view that evolution and religion are compatible is very widely shared. And for those of you who are interested in serious theology, I would recommend a great book called God After Darwin, written by John Haught from Georgetown University. And I love the way that John put it. A world in evolution doesn't follow a strict plan, but is nonetheless given its being, value, and meaning by God's vision for it. The God of evolution doesn't fix things or hoard the joy of creating. Instead, that God shares with all creatures their own openness to an indeterminate future. I think that's a remarkably 
clear sentiment and one that I'm very happy to endorse. If I had to be pressed for a single one paragraph statement of how I regard evolution in light of all this, I'd say it very simply, but I'd use the words that somebody wrote almost 150 years ago. And that is that there is grandeur in an evolutionary view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most wonderful and most beautiful, have been and are being evolved. Those are the concluding words, the last sentence of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And I think those are words to live by. Thank you. I want to uh, apologize for going about 10 minutes over the hour, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, we have time for, we, okay, we have time for a few questions, and uh, um, I would ask uh, something that's been asked before, but has generally been honored only in the breach, and that is, would you please state your name and state your institution affiliation, whatever. So. I'm uh, Keith Palmer from the Loomis Chafee School. Uh, I compliment you so warmly for your concern for your students when you were in Pennsylvania giving evidence. However, I have to perhaps prick the balloon of your triumphalism by asking if it doesn't, if this story doesn't reflect the failure of science education in America. I, I uh, express no triumphalism in my satisfaction of what happened at the Dover trial. This is an argument that will continue, which is why I pointed this out. And I think ultimately, the very fact that we have such arguments, that evolution is cast into such doubt and is such a matter of conflict, is indeed exactly as you said. It's an indictment of science education, and I think more largely, it's an indictment of the scientific community. Because ultimately, we who are working scientists in the scientific community have to recognize the most important members of the scientific community are science educators. And all too often we fail to provide the support, the guidance, the assistance, and the encouragement that science educators need. So triumphalism be damned, I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Calvin. Ken, I, I, um, I'm not sure where, if at all, you and I really disagree. Uh, and I certainly Wait, well, it, let, let me interrupt you briefly. While you were talking, I was figuring, I'm going to disagree with this guy fundamentally. Um, I was with you almost all the way through your talk. The only point that I did disagree on is towards the very end you talked about intelligent design in the broad philosophical perspective, which I put up in that blue slide with what I consider to be intelligent design. But I think you made a mistake by taking this philosophical consideration of meaning and purpose and design and implying that this is what the current intelligent design movement is about. I think it's about special creation, something quite different. But go ahead. Yeah, well, that's, that, that, that was one of the things I wanted to say. But, but I wanted to, say, what I, I want to t address that. But first, I wanted to say something about um, your use of Dennett's quotation, uh, that quotation from Dennett that I had. Um, well, I mean, that's certainly right. Dennett says, all this came to be by virtue of mindless, this mindless process, mindless machinery, this little scrap of robotic uh, material and the like of that. And then you said, but doesn't that show how great God would be for having been able to create the world and create the living world using such a thing? Right, the author of a material yeah. process right. who from that, what Dennett looks at as chaos, could produce this, that's, that, that's pretty remarkable. That remark. is great. Of course, that's totally in, uh, in contradiction with what Dennett thinks. I mean, what he's saying is, oh. it's not the case that some great mind yeah, figured meant, out how to do this. I meant to show that yeah. quote to contradict Dennett. Uh, I mean, right, so it wasn't that your reaction to it was, you, you said your reaction was somewhat different from mine. I think our reactions were the very same thing. I agree. Uh, and then on this other point, you say where you think I misunderstand intelligent design. That's possible. I'm more inclined to take them at face value. Now, maybe that's naive, and maybe they shouldn't be taken at exactly face value, and I think sometimes uh, there's reason to think that's right. But if you take them at face value, it's not the case that what they say requires special creation, unless you mean something very special by special creation. I mean, one way in which that could have happened, 
would be by way of um, God's seeing to it that the right mutation showed up. Another way would be by the right mutation showing up and then God preserving them long enough so that uh, the, the other ones could also show up, the other required ones. Um, it, it seemed to me you're, you're putting words in their mouth. Maybe you're right, yeah. but, and then, well, what, and then on let, that same let, point. Let me answer that first, because okay. this is a good yeah. dialogue, and we'll let, let you keep talking, because I know the audience is interested in what you have to say. Um, in terms of putting their words in their mouth, if they actually thought what you just described, that God uh, caused to happen or preserve favorable mutations, which incidentally, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't agree with that at all, um, but, but if that's what happened, you know what they would never take issue with? They would never take issue with common descent. Because yes. common descent, as you pointed out, would still be validated right. if you had a process that was guided or jerry-rigged or something like that. But every single paper that I've seen recently published on common descent, including chromosome fusion and other things, has been vehemently attacked by the intelligent design folks. And when NOVA aired a series about five years ago, pointing out that the genetic code is proof of the common ancestry of all organisms, which would be consistent with what you said. The Discovery Institute published a whole book arguing against the common descent of the, of the evolutionary code. So I take yeah. them at their word, too, which is that they don't want any part of what you just suggested. You're right, but I, I mean, you quoted something from the beginning of Behe's book, you know, and then, but later on in the book, he says he believes in evolution. The thing is, I think when he talks about Darwinism at the beginning of the book, he's thinking about unguided Darwinism. That's what he really wants to argue against. Yeah, but he didn't say so, that. He said for evolution to be true. Yeah, but he meant, that's what he meant. I mean, otherwise he's got him saying in one place, evolution couldn't be, in another place I, I believe in it. So you've got to give him a little credit. I mean, he's not believing straightforward contradictions. But in any event, um, I won't take any, any more time. I just wanted to say, um, I think you're right, but I think you're a little unduly hard on the ideas. I'll wear that as a badge of pride. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name's Carl Zimmer. Um, I just had a comment and a question. Uh, the comment was that um, uh, it's, it's often not a good idea to steal things from my books because they go out of date. <laughs> and uh, the, it turns out now that uh, you pointed five uh, transitional whales, uh, fossil species. I think it's up to about 30 or 35. I apologize for that. Ah, well, you know, I if wish you, it. Carl, I, if you could help me out with a new diagram, I, I'll steal it immediately. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll work on it. But anyway, the, the, the question I had was uh, sort of what do you think about life after Dover? And um, I, you know, right before I came here, uh, I downloaded this thing from the Discovery Institute. Um, Basically, I think it's my perception, and I want to see what you thought, that the Discovery Institute is basically turning into the Discovery Institute for Media Studies. Because really, all they do now is they attack science writers. And this is uh, a 30-page, 30 31-page <clears throat> attack on uh, my fellow journalist, Chris Mooney, who is the author of The Republican War on Science, um, where basically they say that Chris is basically a sort of a, a one-man national scare campaign against the Discovery Institute. Um, I, you know, it seems I, I don't quite understand the what's the goal with this kind of thing, and I was just curious to get your thoughts. Well, first of all, thank you for the comments about the whales, with, with, and, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Um, with respect to the Discovery Institute, um, they saw they they clearly wrote the playbook for what the Dover Board of Education did, as I indicated, and I actually have a copy of that playbook at home, and I can show it to you because that's pretty much what the Dover Board did. They saw the train wreck coming. Um, and <coughs> they clearly put pressure on their own people to pull out. Um, and they successfully pulled five of them out, including the director of the Discovery Institute. Far from ignoring the trial, they actually sent a staff person to the trial named Casey Luskin, who attended the trial. And every recess, every hour and a half when the judge called a recess, reporters would pile out in the courtroom gather into a lobby by the elevators. Luskin would then run right into the lobby, stand in front of the elevators, and give the Discovery Institute's interpretation of everything that was wrong with evolutionary testimony So at, at, in the previous session. So they have tried to spin everything that has happened in one way or another. They also, I mean, the one thing they're good at is media. Um, and they're brilliant at public relations. Um, as you and I were talking about ahead of time, when NOVA did this wonderful eight-hour television series in the fall of, uh, of 2001, they actually had a book out two weeks before the series aired saying everything that was wrong in the series. So these guys are remarkably good at media. What they're not very good at 
is scientific research and experimentation. And I think that's the key point that I would always try to make in public. Um, naturally, they're going to go after Chris Mooney because Chris Mooney disturbs them because he's exposed some of the things that they've done. Um, I think Chris should probably wear that as a badge of pride. Um, and I think other people sh certainly should in, in science as well. Their clear strategy now is to pretend, in, 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 in contrary to real history, to pretend that they've never advocated the teaching of intelligent designs in schools. And all they want to do is to open up science classrooms by talking about the evidence against evolution. Well, intelligent design never amounted to anything except a collection of arguments against evolution. So once again, it's trying to accomplish the same end by putting a different label on it. And I know they aren't down. Uh, they're down, but I know they aren't beaten. And I know that this is something that we will have to work on throughout the country and in the public imagination for a long time. Um, I'm Ross Kennedy Schaefer. I'm a junior physics major here. Um, I, I like your interpretation that there's not necessarily you know, this inherent contradiction between science and religion, between evolution and faith. But it seems like there is still a contradiction in maybe the political sphere in, in, public percept, in public perception of science and faith. For sure. How do you think that's going to continue to play out and what can be done to maybe even just you know, express your point that there is an inherent con contradiction or to show people of faith that they don't have to be afraid of evolution? Well, um, I, I, I've done my best to show people of faith they don't have to be afraid of evolution. Um, I think Francis Collins, being as eminent and as public a scientist as he is, is making a greater contribution. Um, and I think he's doing a good job of it. And I, and I think his sincerity and his, uh, um, his, his, uh, his religious and scientific sincerity is, is absolutely extraordinary. Um, I think, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm the most worried about in our country right now. Um, and that is one of, the things, one of the things I liked about science, and one of the reasons I wanted to go into science as a career, and maybe you too, is because science isn't politicized. Um, which is to say, you know, there's no such thing as a conservative version of the Krebs cycle or a liberal version of the cell cycle. I mean, it just doesn't exist. And I went to scientific meetings for 25 years, the early part of my career. I don't recall talking politics even once. I, uh, I'm a, I, I belong and I'm an officer in the American Society for Cell Biology. I go to cell biology meetings every year. The last two years, it's been nothing but politics. And the reason for that is the major political parties seem to have picked up scientific issues as part of their partisan agenda. And as an experiment, I asked a group in my own freshman biology class this year, would you regard evolution as a liberal or conservative idea? And they all said, oh, it's a liberal idea. It's a left-wing liberal. They didn't say commie pinko, but they all said it's a left-wing idea. And I said, well, you know, first of all, that's interesting. I think your answer is right. In the sense, in the current political climate, people would associate evolution with the left wing of the political spectrum. But I said, you know what? If this was 100 years ago, if it was 1906, and I talked to a class of young men at Yale, because 1906, young men was all that was here, and I asked them, do you know the theories of Mr. Darwin? They'd say yes. How would you place it on the political spectrum? I'd bet 20 bucks that that class in 1906 would unanimously have said, oh, that is a conservative laissez-faire economics idea, which is associated with the right wing of the political spectrum. And if you want proof of that, think about the Scopes trial. William Jennings Bryan, who prosecuted John Scopes, was associated with progressive causes in the United States, and he saw evolution as a right wing enemy. Um, therefore, you know, I would argue that any idea that during its time has remained constant but has inhabited both the left and the right wing of this political spectrum is inherently not a political idea. And the politicization of science is the trend in our country right now that bothers me the most. Oh, so, sorry, I think, oh, great. Okay. okay. Um, you just said that, uh, you uh, commented yeah, on, sir, I'm your sorry, name? Dale okay. Martin, I'm teaching Thanks. the Religious Studies Department. In fact, I was the one who said yesterday, everybody should say their name, so I don't... Um, I, I, I knew you did, that's why. <laughs> just, yeah, getting, yeah, it's always honored in the breach, right? You're, you're, you're appealing to the wise ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about the need for science education and the need for more sophistication in these kinds of things, and you know, that, that struck me that uh, those of us who teach in religious studies, and, and I use, actually do history of religion more than I do theology, but uh, I also believe that what most of the time we're working with is people who have grown up and they may have 
progressed and gotten more sophisticated in their notions of the world or psychology or all kinds of things, but they're kind of still dealing with theological notions they had at 12. And they've never progressed in their sophistication about theological ideas. Um, and I think, so theological education is another place we need to go. So what do mean, people mean when they talk about God or God's agency? What do people mean when they talk about the supernatural? I'm constantly trying to get people to do this. One of the, thing, the ways you ended up was by sort of saying, science uh, is, a, is a way of dealing with the world up to a limit. And the, the metaphor was limitation. And then there may be truths or things that are legitimate for us to believe beyond that limit. That, and that's one metaphorical way of talking about the relationship of science to other kinds of beliefs or faith. I haven't heard anybody talk about this in terms of what may be called discourse theory, which is really that science is a discursive realm that makes a, a very usable sense of our experiences and the world around us. There may be other kinds of discourses that just aren't the same kind of thing as science, whether that be music or ethics or, or religion. Religion might be one among many. And I was just wondering if you might like to comment about that being a sort of, uh, how that kind of way of thinking about the differences between kinds of knowledge uh, is different from or like your model of limitation. Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll comment very briefly because I, I, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, I think the perfect example of the kind of, of intellectual imperialism that uh, evolutionary biology uh, can be guilty of when taken to an extreme is E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience. Now, Consilience is a great book, and E.O. Wilson is a great scientist and a wonderful human being. Um, but Consilience basically tells, not just to religion, but to music, to art, and literary criticism, forget it, guys, we're taking over. We're going to have an evolutionary explanation for every one of these disciplines. It's going to be founded basically on evolutionary psychology. And, and any idea of uh, law, uh, literary criticism or artistic criticism that somehow deals with history, human traditions, oral traditions, myths, so forth and so on, we're going to explain everything by evolutionary psychology. So don't bother yourselves. Um, I think far from being a scientifically valid notion, I think that's, that's completely naive. Um, and to argue, um, certainly evolutionary psychology and an understanding of human cognition and thought process can make big contributions to enriching our understanding of these areas, but it's not going to take everything over. It's not going to displace them. And in that respect, all of the humanities are pretty much in the same position as religion in terms of fighting for their turf as independent disciplines that analyze their particular questions. So religion is not alone in terms of the kind of, as I described it, intellectual imperialism. And I think basically the preservation, I say this even as a scientist, preservation of a humanistic culture is extremely important and something that should concern everybody in the academy. Got one more question? Uh, my name is Larry Vogel. I teach philosophy at Connecticut College. Um, I'm connecting the Professor Plantinga's talk and yours, and, and I, I would share, and I think probably most of us do, the attempt to distinguish sort of subtle connections between evolution and faith with um, intelligent design understood as special creation and its moral implications. So leaving that behind, the question to me really becomes, do you share the view that Professor Plantinga had before that Darwinism is neutral between unguidedness and guidedness? Um, the, the answer is, in a sense, yes. Okay? Um, but a, a, again, I, I'm uncomfortable with the word Darwinism. We don't talk about things in science usually as involving an ideology, as Darwinism implies. But the notion of guided is something that all biologists, and you heard this in the questions after his talk, that all biologists and most natural science instinctively recoil against because we don't like the idea that there's a supernatural force that's fudging our experiments or fudging natural history. Um, I don't think that an evolutionary process has to be guided for a creator to be certain that it would give rise to intelligent, reflective, and self-aware beings. And another person who's made that argument, I think, far more capably than I can is Simon Conway Morris the very distinguished paleontologist who worked on the Burgess Shale, which was the basis of Steve Gould's book, Wonderful Life. And Simon Conway Morris has argued that what evolution does, for sure, is it explores adaptive space. 
as Sewell Wright would have called it. Meaning that no matter how evolution is unpredictable in detail, you can be sure that you're going to get large carnivorous animals that swim in the ocean, and that you're going to get plants that will capture sunlight, and you're going to get tiny little animals with thin wings that will be able to fly like insects do. They might not be fish, and they might not be insects, and they might not be flowering plants as we know them, but you're going to get those kinds of organisms. And in that sense, evolution, Conway Morris would argue, doesn't have to be guided in the sense to be jerry-rigged, to be sure, given time, to produce an intelligent, reflective, and self-aware being. That Conway Morris, also a Christian, would argue that was the ultimate creator's goal, and therefore the creator could create the process without screwing with it every step of the way to make it come out the way he wants it. So, so one follow-up. Would you agree, then, that the language of contingency um, isn't sufficient to explain kind of the material basis of what becomes life. That but the language needs, of contingency is or is not? Is not actually completely sufficient. That is, one doesn't want to rule out chance, but at the same time, do you need any um, reconsideration of the very nature of matter uh, and some notion of uh, a kind of potentiality or disposition yeah. well, uh, in, order to, in order to do justice to your notion of guidedness? Um, I, I, again, I'm not sure about the notion of guidance. It's not a word that I would use, and it's not one that I'm comfortable with. But the contingency, as Steve Gould argued for it brilliantly in Wonderful Life, is a kind of unpredictability. But I think if Steve were alive, he would admit to a dialogue in which we say, when we say that evolution, like all historical processes, is a contingent process, a little change here could result in a big change way down the road. That's absolutely true. But the contingency of evolution is constrained. It's constrained by the laws of physics and chemistry, by the nature of matter. When we say that evolutionary change is random, we don't mean random in the sense of anything can happen. We mean evolutionary change can happen in an unpredictable way. But evolutionary change, even mutation, is always constrained by the developmental history of an organism and by the forces of natural selection, which are definitely not random. So once again, I'm uncomfortable with the very worst use of the word guided. And the way that I would prefer to describe, to enclose the science within the theology, is to say that evolution as we understand it, and you saw it on the slide, a radically contingent materialist process can nonetheless operate within the overall envelope of a creator's plan. Thank you. Thank you.